Welcome to today's Registrant Outreach Webinar, which will focus on several portfolio manager topics that we highlighted in our recently published annual summary report for registrants. My name is Trevor Walls. I'm a senior accountant in the Compliance and Registrant Regulation branch. I'm here with Scott Lasky, who is an accountant and works with me on the portfolio manager team. Our team's responsibilities include performing compliance reviews of portfolio managers. I'm also joined by Lena Kreta and Kevin Hanna, who are advisors in the OSC's investor office. Before we begin, here's our standard disclaimer for presentations, which you may later read on your own. Here's today's agenda. First, Kevin and Lena will discuss the investor office's work on senior investor issues. Then, Scott will cover findings and some best practices we've identified so far from our review of PMs that have a high percentage of senior clients. I'll then give an overview of PMs operating as online advisors, including their regulatory obligations, findings from our compliance reviews, and best practices. And then Scott will discuss guidance for small firms on their compliance obligations. Then we'll have a question and answer session. For today's webinar, please submit your questions on the portal. We suggest submitting your questions throughout our presentation, rather than waiting for the question and answer session to begin. This will allow us more time to review and consider your questions. Now, over to Kevin from the OSC's Investor Office. Thanks, Trevor. Hello, everyone. I'm here today with my colleague, Lena, to speak to you about the investor office and the work that we're doing in the senior space. We're going to start with a bit of an overview on what the investor office is and why it's focused on seniors. We're also going to share a few of our learnings from the research and stakeholder engagement that we've conducted as we learn more about the needs of older investors before getting into some issues and challenges that we see facing advisors as investors continue to live longer lives, as well as some of our planned next steps. So, the Investor Office is a regulatory operations branch of the OSC. We launched just under two years ago, at the end of October 2015, after the former OSC Investor, our Office of the Investor, merged with the Investor Education Fund. The office sets the strategic direction and leads the OSC's efforts in investor education, engagement, outreach, and research. It also brings the investor perspective to policy making and operations, and plays a key role in the oversight of OBSI. We also lead the OSC's work in the area of behavioral insights and are examining how behavioral economics and finance concepts can be applied to capital markets and improve our policy and regulatory approaches. So why is the investor office focusing on seniors? Well, seniors are the fastest growing demographic group in Canada. According to the National Seniors Council, by 2031, the number of seniors will almost double to 9 million people, which rep will represent close to one quarter of Canada's population. This means that more Canadians are living and working for longer. And for many people, aging can be accompanied by health and mobility issues or possibly cognitive challenges that may impact the way that they interact with financial service providers and make them more susceptible to financial abuse. The changing demographics in Canada, and particularly in Ontario as it's Canada's most populous province, are creating new challenges for both regulators and the industry. As a regulator, we will need to be able to adapt to the changing circumstances that firms and clients will face which means seeing new products and new ways to access services. The OSC has identified seniors' issues as a key priority, as they represent an extremely important and growing segment of investors whose needs demand attention. We are focused on addressing the issues of older investors in a more comprehensive way, including policy, outreach, training, and education. So as part of the OSC's continued efforts to deliver strong investor protection and responsive regulation, the Investor Office has been charged with developing the OSC's senior strategy. In doing so, we are working on ways to provide practical guidance, resources, and tools to firms, senior investors, and their families, while recognizing that there is no one-size-fits-all solution. We know that this is something we can't do alone, and so we have made some great strides in establishing partnerships with organizations uh, engaging with seniors already to understand their unique needs and issues. Improving outcomes for seniors will require commitment and action from all stakeholders, and we believe that creating a comprehensive strategy requires having the right people around the table. As such, last year we announced the creation of our Seniors Expert Advisory Committee, or SEAC for short. 
CX serves as a forum to discuss and address older investors' needs. Uh, it, inv it advises staff on securities-related policy and operational developments that impact seniors and provides input on the OSC's related education and outreach activities. Uh, members of SEAC are, are represented by disciplines including law, academia, healthcare, inf law enforcement, seniors, advo seniors advocates, and the industry. We also maintain a, a number of other initiatives as we work to support seniors and older, other old investors. One key resource we provide is GetSmartAboutMoney.ca, our award-winning investor education website that provides investors with unbiased information and interactive resources to help them make informed investing decisions. Uh, this past summer, we relaunched a newly redesigned and mobile-friendly version of the site that allows anyone to engage with the entire suite of investing articles, videos, tools, and calculators on any device. The refreshed version of GetSmartAboutMoney.ca is consistent with our approach to developing solutions that meet investors' needs wherever they are. Last year, we also introduced a new Teletown Hall program, which is similar in format to a call-in radio show, with OSC staff providing information, answering questions, and conducting live polls over the course of one hour. For in-person outreach, the Investor Office leads the OSC in the Community Program, which brings OSC staff to communities across Ontario to deliver investor education seminars and meet with community organizations that are impacted by or have interest in investor issues, and in particular, these are often seniors groups and retirement homes. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we also rely on a number of partnerships to help augment our seniors outreach program and provide insight into the needs and issues facing seniors today. Uh, some of our partners include the National Initiative for the Care of the Elderly, or NICE, uh, CARP, formerly the Canadian Association of Retired Persons, the, uh, the Toronto Police Service, and Elder Abuse Ontario. Uh, if you want to refer to slide 11, uh, this is just an example of the newly redesigned GetSmartAboutMoney.ca, which is a fully re responsive uh, and dynamic website that offers a full suite of investor education tools and resources. Uh, part of what we've added to GetSmartAboutMoney.ca is uh, a new Growing Older Hub, which gathers a number of resources and tools that reflect some of the financial needs that accompany aging in place. Uh, there are resources on planning for retirement, paying off debt, helping out family members, living in retirement, estate planning, and a number of others. Uh, these resources help communicate a lot of financial issues that investors may need to consider as they age and the questions that they may need to ask an advisor in order to help plan uh, their retirement or later stages in life. So moving on, one of the key issues that we've been working on as we work through our senior strategy is defining who a senior is and what characteristics make them unique from other groups of investors. We've looked at a number of sources, engaged with numerous stakeholders, and conducted a lot of research around this topic to help us understand the ages and different life stages that people typically consider themselves to be senior, as well as some of the common identifiers that, that are used by other regulators and government agencies, uh, other businesses and organizations uh, to help define when someone becomes a senior. Uh, what we've found is that there doesn't appear to be one universally applicable definition in Canada to, to determine when someone becomes a senior. Uh, but for the purposes of government, uh, many organizations often rely on the age of 65 as a marker in which someone can be considered a senior. This is often used as the age to determine when somebody can qualify for certain government programs, such as the eligibility to collect old age security. However, in consultation with a lot of our stakeholders and other senior organizations, or senior focused organizations, we have repeatedly heard that seniors are not a homogenous group, and that the characteristics that uh, define uh, this group uh, can greatly change as they continue to age. Uh, the issues facing uh, a 65-year-old can look very different from those of a 75-year-old and different still from 80 all the way up. And as people continue to age, their priorities shift. Uh, things like the cost of housing and health care may become more of a concern that can affect their financial needs. So because aging is a process that doesn't stop at 65, it's not always appropriate to lump anyone in that age cohort uh, under the label of senior. Uh, in fact, many people can strongly react to being called a senior, and even though they may tick the box of being 65 years or older, they don't identify with the stereotypical idea of what a senior is or how they live. Often, uh, they may only consider themselves to be a senior some of the time, but not always. We've done some examination into when people feel they are or not a senior, and one of the most common times is when people consider themselves uh, to be one is when there's opportunity to get a discount, such as the seniors discount at Shoppers Drug Mart. 
We've also done some research into the financial planning of pre- and post-retirees in Canada. This was to understand the financial needs, priorities, and concerns of people over the age of 50 and examine how, they shift, uh, how those priorities shift as people transition into retirement. One of the key findings of the study was that nearly half of Ontarians over the age of 50 do not have a retirement savings plan. And among those that do, nearly a third of them feel that they're behind in their savings according to their plan. Even more concerning is that one in five pre-retirees in Ontario have not even started to save for retirement, and nearly a third have no idea how much money they will need to save to help fund their retirement. Given that we know that Canadians are living longer than ever, and that as they age, their income needs will likely shift as things like housing, mobility, and healthcare become greater concerns, many investors will be looking for investment products and strategies that can help them close the gap between where they're at in their savings plan and what they require to finance their retirement. This holds significant implications for advisors and portfolio managers as they work with their clients to develop plans to save for and live in retirement. It requires managing an ongoing relationship and having regular discussions about the client's needs, goals, priorities and that may change over time. As that relationship progresses, there are a number of issues and challenges that advisors and portfolio managers may chase with, face with their aging clients. At this point, I'm going to turn to my colleague, Lena, to discuss some of the issues facing advisors that we've discussed as we continue to work through our senior strategy. Thanks, Kevin. So as part of our ongoing work, Investor Office is continuing to develop a greater understanding of the challenges for both regulators and the financial industry adapting to the ever-increasing aging population. What we've been hearing is that the changing demographic is presenting some challenges to advisors who are servicing senior clients. In particular, some of the reoccurring issues or situations that we are hearing from our stakeholders and partners about include the challenges of servicing clients who are showing signs of diminished mental capacity or who they suspect may be victims of financial exploitation. There are also concerns being brought to the surface about the potential for financial exploitation in situations involving powers of attorney, particularly by family members. While the power of attorney can be a useful tool to assist seniors in managing their money, it is also a common scenario for financial abuse. Lastly, we have heard about advisors' concerns of breaching privacy laws if they were to raise concerns about a client's mental or physical capacity with the client's family members or notifying a third party about concerns of financial exploitation of the client without the client's consent. As regulators, we should be assisting firms in responding to these challenges. So to assist us in these issues and challenges, as Kevin had pointed out, we have formed the Senior Expert Advisory Committee to bring together experts in various disciplines to discuss these key issues. I will now briefly talk about some of the red flags of diminished capacity, financial exploitation, and the key issues on power of attorneys and privacy laws that advisors are finding themselves confronted with. We have heard that advisors are encountering situations where their, cli their senior clients manifest signs of diminished capacity. Aging can diminish the capacity to understand finances, particularly if a person suffers from Alzheimer's disease or other forms of dementia or cognitive impairment. As regulators, this raises concerns because it is important for a person to be capable of understanding relevant information and appreciate the consequences of their decisions to manage their investment. Cognitive decline, as we understand, is often gradual and may be inconsistent with the client behaving normally some days and erratically on others. From our medical professionals on this Senior Expert Advisory Committee, we understand that cognitive de decline ranges from the effects of normal age-related memory changes to some type of dementia, such as Alzheimer's disease. Symptoms of dementia commonly can include loss of memory, judgment, and reasoning, as well as changes in mood, behavior, and communication abilities. One of the early flags of dementia is impaired ability to understand financial issues, and so you as advisors can often be the first to witness these signs. And Alzheimer's Society of Canada actually reports that there's approximately 560,000 Canadians living with dementia. De based on the statistics, 10% of Canadians who are 65 plus currently suffer from dementia, and this rises with age. In fact, it appears that 20% of adults older than age su 80 suffer from dementia, and further increases above the age of 90 years old to more than 40 percent. Moving on to financial exploitation, the Government of Canada and Elder Abuse Ontario report that financial exploitation is the most common form of elder abuse in Canada and in fact is often perpetrated by family members. 
The aging demographic is causing some concern that financial exploitation may be increasing as people live longer and suffer from more physical and cognitive impairment. As regulators, this raises concerns with the financial well-being of all investors, including seniors, but financial exploitation of seniors may be particularly devastating as they may not be able to recover from any financial losses, particularly if they are on a fixed income. What we're hearing is that financial abuse can be difficult to identify or recognize and even define for that matter. In fact, there's no specific legal definition of senior financial abuse defined in Canadian law. Now, Canadian law does contain a few definitions of financial abuse, but there are none that specifically apply to senior abuse. There are statutes that define financial abuse in the care setting environment, uh, is from what we are aware of. For example, the Long-Term Care Homes Act and the Retirement Homes Act define financial abuse, as does the Public Guardian and Trustee Act, which defines abuse as the misappropriation of funds, resources, or property by fraud, deception, or coercion. Now, again, we've heard that it's very difficult for firms to confidently identify financial exploitation, but simply speaking, it does generally refer to the theft or exploitation of a person's money, property, or assets. Listed on slide 14, uh, you'll see th are some ways in which financial exploitation manifests itself and can include abuse of power of attorney. So as I mentioned earlier, we have heard some concerns about the potential for financial exploitation in situations involving powers of attorney. However, we've also heard of the benefits that a power of attorney can have and can assist seniors in managing their money. Advisors should be speaking to their clients and educating them about putting a power of attorney in place, regardless of age, before any issues arise that can affect a client's ability to act for themselves or make decisions, such as diminished mental capacity. This document will assist in giving authority to a firm to contact a designated person, sometimes even a family member, when a client's capacity is in question and investment decisions are required. Obviously, circumstances can change for investors in terms of who their power of attorney might be. They might have a falling out with the power of attorney or possibly even they may die. So keeping a do an open dialogue with your client about the status of the POA is very important. You also want to have a process in place if you suspect a misuse of the power of attorney, an additional contract that a client may have given you, and what your internal escalation process may be. And Scott will be speaking to that a little bit later. Which brings me to the last area that I wanted to touch on. While servicing clients who may be suffering from mental impairment or maybe the victims of financial abuse may be a challenge, Canadian privacy laws also raise concern about a family's ability to raise those concerns with the family member without the client's consent. As a general rule, the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act does not generally allow for the disclosure of personal information without the client's consent. So in cases where the client is not capable of understanding the situation, a firm may contact the client's P power of attorney assuming they have one. As of late, however, amendments have been made to, to the Personal Information Protection and Electronics Document Act through the passing of Bill S-4, referred to as the Digital Privacy Act. What this allows is a financial institution to report financial abuse to a government institution or the client's next of kin without the client's consent and in circumstances where they believe or have reasonable ground that the individual has been or may be the victim of financial abuse. Now, while this appears to be a good step forward, what we have heard is that the amendments are not particularly helpful because it doesn't define what is, a financial, what is financial abuse or to which government organization the financial abuse should be reported to, which is presenting more challenges to organizations about complying with the new rules. So in closing and in moving forward, Obviously, at the OSC here, investor protection is at the core of everything that we do, and we are committed to improving outcomes for investors. Protecting our older investors is a particularly a priority for the OSC, and we are focused through the development of our senior strategy, which Kevin spoke to earlier, on addressing the issues of older investors in a more comprehensive way, including through policy, outreach, training, and education. One thing for sure is that we can't do this alone, this is definitely a multi-stakeholder solution and we will continue to establish new partnerships and continue to work with our existing ones to better understand the unique needs and issues of Ontario seniors. I will now turn it over to Scott, who will be speaking about compliance and registrant regulations, compliance reviews of portfolio managers.
Thank you, Lena. Our branch is currently completing our sweep review of a sample of PMs and EMDs with a significant proportion of clients who are 60 years and over. We focused on senior investors because, among other reasons, they are becoming a larger part of the population, often rely on investments for financial security and retirement, and have a reduced time horizon to recover from financial loss. The focus during this presentation will be on the PM reviews. What constitutes a senior investor can be a matter of debate. We decided to use 60 years old for the purpose of information gathering for our 2016 risk assessment questionnaire, which was then used to select firms for the sweep. Once our sweep is complete, our, in our intent is to publish guidance for firms to use when dealing with vulnerable investors, and in particular with senior clients. Therefore, the goal for today's presentation is to present a few preliminary observations coming from the sweep, some examples of issues PMs have had to deal with relating to senior investors, and review previously published guidance we have provided in our annual reports for dealers, advisors, and investment fund managers. <coughs> Finally, we provide a list of guidance from other organizations that may be useful for you on a slide of this presentation. We selected a sample of PM firms to participate in our sweep review. Firms were selected if they had indicated they had a significant number of clients 60 years old or and over. The majority of PM firms selected through this process were small in size, meaning they had between one to three advising representatives. In a lot of cases, the advising representatives themselves were over 60 years old, often have an extensive history in managing the senior clients' portfolios. A small number of advising representatives and their age ties into the main focus of another topic of our presentation, business succession planning for small registrants, which I will discuss later. I will provide more details of the main areas we focused on during our reviews of PMs. 1. Policies and procedures for dealing with senior clients. 2. Previous issues firms have dealt with when servicing their senior clients and how they handled the matters. and three. Client files for senior investors, including KYC and suitability of investments. We assessed whether adequate KYC information had been collected, for example, risk tolerance, time horizon, and income needs. We also reviewed how the investment portfolio aligned with the client's KYC information. Part of the review involved inquiring of the firm's CCO, UDP and advising reps and reviewing any written policies and procedures the firms had had for dealing with senior clients. We generally found that PMs did not have written policies and procedures for dealing with senior clients. However, the firms that had had to deal with issues with their own clients were generally well informed about these issues and had taken reasonable steps to address them. An example of an issue several firms had to deal with was signs of financial abuse by the client's relatives, such as an adult children regularly requesting their parent to send them amounts in cash. Some registrants dealt with this matter by contacting the client's lawyer or accountant or both. One registrant contacted the police on several occasions. We have been told by registrants that balancing these remedies with concerns about privacy is an issue. We recommend you consult your own legal counsel should you ever encounter any similar situations. Another example of an issue firms have had to deal with is their clients suffering with dementia. Some of the red flags our PMs have used to identify these issues include 1. If a client calls them several times by mistake. 2. The client calls to request something they had previously communicated. 3. If the client normally dresses to impress for their meeting with the AR but turns up disheveled. 4. Large withdrawals or unusual patterns of withdrawals. 5. Inability to contact the client or the client never calls them back. 6. A change in investment style. 7. Voices in the background when talking to the client on the phone. And finally 8. Family members attempting power of attorneys out of the blue. You should develop policy procedures that address these and other types of issues that can result when dealing with vulnerable investors. More on that later. We reviewed client files, KYC info, investment management agreements and client statements for a sample of senior clients at each firm. Most PMs did not collect any different types of KYC information based on the age of their clients. Some firms collected contact information for the client's lawyer, 
accountant, children, and trusted person. Other firms decided to start collecting this type of information as a result of our review. In some cases, we observed missing KYC information similar to other reviews we have conducted and commented on in several annual reports and staff notices. For example, failure to document a client's risk tolerance or income requirements. We also observed in some cases a failure to document updates to KYC information collected from clients, again similar to other reviews we've conducted and provided guidance in the past, for example CSA Staff Notice 31336. Generally, portfolio managers did not have a process in place to update KYC information for senior investors any more frequently than for their other clients. Most had a process to update KYC at least annually for all of their clients, however. The deficiencies we identified usually related to a lack of documentation of the KYC information. Generally, we were able to get comfortable that the AR knew their clients based on extensive information they were able to communicate to us verbally. Most firms' portfolios for senior investors were well diversified and consisted of vanilla investments in blue chip equities, bonds, preferred shares, and cash equivalents which were in line with the client's recommended asset allocation. No firms had a policy specifically restricting any types of investments or concentrations of investments relating to senior investors. In general, we were comfortable that the investments held for their senior clients were suitable for their clients. Sometimes, we were only able to do this by discussing the client with the advising representative due to the missing KYC information or lack of documentation of KYC updates. It is important for firms to thoroughly document all clients' KYC information, but especially those of vulnerable clients. This offers protection not only to the client but also to the firm in the case of any litigation. For today's discussion, we're focusing on seniors but the guidance may equally apply to other vulnerable investors, such as those with diminished cognitive capacity, severe or long-term illnesses, mental or physical disabilities, or language barriers. CRR Branch's annual summary reports for dealers, advisors, and investment fund managers for 2016 and 2017 both contain guidance relating to vulnerable investors. Senior investors, especially those with diminished mental capacity, are vulnerable to investment advice that is unsuitable, investment fraud, and financial abuse. We provided guidance that firms should have adequate policies and procedures for the protection of investors, including vulnerable investors, and provided examples of what a firm's policies and procedures should include. For example, 1. Provision of training for advising reps and other staff that interact with clients such as administrative staff and compliance staff, for matters such as communicating with senior clients, identifying signs of elder abuse or diminished mental capacity. An escalation process, if issues are identified, for example, an advising rep informing the firm's chief compliance officer. 3. Ensuring that KYC information collected includes the name and contact information for a trusted person of the senior client. 4. Provide clearer communications with senior clients, for example, larger font size in client reporting, using plain language and avoiding acronyms, or meeting a client in a quiet place with good lighting. 5. Suitability of investments for accounts of senior investors, for example, age-based heightened review criteria for certain investments or product concentration. Seniors have a shorter time frame to recover from losses in their portfolios and may need more liquid investments to fund their lifestyle. 6. The importance of a power of attorney or POA for short and consideration of when a POA may be necessary. A registrant should generally avoid being a client's POA. 7. Discussions with clients about the existence of a POA document and the retention of any POA documents. And finally 8. Identification and escalation of the misuse or abuse of POAs. For more detailed guidance, please refer to the two staff notices I mentioned. Our next steps will be to finalize our sweep review and issue our deficiency reports. We will continue to review policies and procedures relating to senior investors as part of all our reviews going forward. As noted, we plan to issue more guidance in the future. In the meantime, please refer to the resources listed at the end of, the, of this presentation for additional guidance. Now, over to Trevor for the next topic of our presentation.
Thank you, Scott. I'll provide an overview of online advisors and their obligations. I'll discuss the findings from reviews of these firms along with best practices to avoid the deficiencies we identified. Online advisors are PMs approved to provide discretionary portfolio management services through an interactive website. The first firms were approved in the summer of 2014, so they've been operating in Canada for three years. They use an online questionnaire to gather clients' KYC information and typically offer passive, simple portfolios of ETFs or low-cost, redeemable investment funds. Because they use technology and have simple investing strategies, they are able to offer these services at a low cost to all types of investors, including retail clients with as little as $1 to initially invest. There are about a dozen online advisors currently operating in Canada, with several more in the pre-approval stage. Now that's still a small number compared to the population of over 800 PM firms across Canada, but they continue to be a growth area. And there's still a lot of investor, media, and regulatory interest in these firms. And they're of interest to our traditional PMs as competitors, business partners, or because they are considering entering this space. In September of 2015, the CSA published regulatory expectations for online advisors in Staff Notice 31342. This notice remains current and relevant for the CSA's views. Here are some of the key points in the notice. There is no exemption from securities law for these firms. All rules, including for KYC and suitability, apply. Their KYC process must amount to a meaningful discussion with the client, such as through the KYC questionnaire, disclosure on the website, and any AR client discussions. ARs must be actively involved in the KYC and suitability process, including reviewing and approving KYC information and assessing suitability of the recommended portfolio. Clients must be able to talk to an advising rep if they choose. Firms need to inform the OSC or your principal, locate, uh, sorry, principal regulator if you're located outside of Ontario if you plan to operate as an online advisor. And finally, any materially different business models, products, or processes compared to those described in the notice will need to be carefully considered by the CSA. Currently, there are a few different business models. The first few firms that were approved were new registrants operating solely as online advisors. But now, there are several firms that operate as both an online advisor and as a traditional PM. Further, firms differ in how they may have discussions with clients. About two-thirds of firms have been approved as an always call advisor, meaning an advising rep must always have a discussion with a client, such as by telephone or online chat, before their account is opened and invested. The remaining one-third have been approved as a call when needed advisor, which requires an advising rep to contact the client when she or the system determines it to be necessary or when the client requests a discussion. The call when needed model requires a more comprehensive online KYC and suitability process compared to an always call model. For example, in a call when needed model, all required KYC information, like investment needs and objectives, risk tolerance, and financial circumstances, must be captured in the online KYC questionnaire. As in most cases, no other KYC information will be collected or clarified through a client uh, advising rep discussion. We expect a systematic process to identify and resolve inconsistencies and in answers to KYC questions. An example of an inconsistency is a client answering they have a low risk tolerance but then stating they have a maximum growth objective. 
We also expect a systematic process to identify when an advising rep should call the client, such as in, in, when there's inconsistencies in answers, questions are not completed, or when an, uh, when an investor has unique circumstances, such as uh, they identify they have investment restrictions. We've also asked these firms to demonstrate how they will identify when they need to have a call with clients that are seniors who may have more complex needs. Many firms' process is to automatically call clients over a certain age, such as 65. Now, a systematic process, as compared to a judgmental or ad hoc process, allows for more accuracy and consistency and for an audit trail and for regulators to pre-review and approve the process. For registration categories, both the restricted portfolio manager and portfolio manager categories have been used, with the difference being due to different business models. In most cases now, we are using the PM category, and then as needed, restricting the firm's advice through terms and conditions of registration. For example, call when needed advisors have terms and conditions to restrict their online advice to ETFs, investment funds, or cash and equivalents with no use of leverage or short selling. Now, there are three different ways we review online advisors. Firstly, pre-registration review for a new PM applicant whose business plan is to become an online advisor. This takes place as part of our registration as the first compliance review process for all new firm applications. Secondly, through the filing of an F5 notice by an existing PM, which indicates they plan to change their business activities to include online advising. And thirdly, compliance field review after a PM has been registered, approved, and is operational as an online advisor. Our goal is to try to review firms after one or two years of operation as an online advisor, in addition to a pre-registration or F5 filing review. The purpose of all three types of reviews is first, to assess the adequacy of the KYC and suitability process, including the KYC questions, the system logic, the model portfolios, the role and number of advising representatives, and how and when discussions with clients will take place. A second purpose is to assess compliance with securities law and expectations in CSA Staff Notice 31342 on online advice. And third purpose, uh, in the case of field reviews, is to assess compliance with any terms and conditions of registration and any representations in pre-registration reviews or F5 filings. Our reviews for a firm wanting to be an online advisor are comprehensive and, depending on the business model and the nature, uniqueness, and quality of the submitted materials, typically takes several months from beginning to end. This slide shows examples of what we ask to see and review. Now, I'm not going to be going through each one, but I, I will want to highlight uh, that we do ask how client identity obligations will be, will be met since clients are not met in person, and how cybersecurity risks will be, be addressed. And for pre-registration and F5 reviews, we also ex expect a written business plan to be provided. A more complete list of what we review was published this July in our annual summary reports for registrants. And of course, we may ask to review additional things when needed. During a review, we typically interview the key persons, such as the actual or proposed UDP, CCO, and advising reps, ask for a live demonstration of the system, and we also ask for hard copies of the KYC questions, including choices for answers, and the system logic, so we can review in detail. If possible, we ask for online access to the in-development system so we can use and test the system as an investor would. 
And if available, we ask to get the same system access as the firm's advising rep or CCO would have to review from a supervisory perspective. We also review agreements and disclosure, such as with investors and service providers. And in a pre-registration or F5 review, we typically provide detailed written questions and comments on these items, which will need to be addressed before the firm will be approved. Now, I'll discuss the key findings from our sweep review of a number of operational online advisors, which was completed in 2016. Note that most but not all of these firms were subject to a review before they began operating. The sweep review was a joint effort by OSC and British Columbia Securities Commission staff of online advisors located in Ontario and British Columbia who were registered and operating for one year or longer at that time. For the best practices, I have also considered what other online advisors that were subject to other types of reviews were doing as well in an effort to enhance the best practices. Now here are some general observations from the sweep. First, the firms had a greater technology focus compared to, for, uh, to PMs who meet clients face to face. For example, some firms had a chief technology officer and, and, and at some firms, 50% or more of their employees were programmers or developers. The online systems were easy to use and understand from an investor perspective. Typically, an investor had to answer about 10 KYC questions. Most firms tried to balance the requirement for knowing the client with not losing a potential client by asking too many questions. In most cases, the KYC questions were straightforward and there were examples, pop-ups, or videos with information to educate and help investors understand the questions and industry terms. Simple system logic. The mathematical logic or algorithm to translate an investor's answers to KYC questions to a recommendation for a specific model portfolio was simple so even a fifth grader or regulator could understand. This made it straightforward for us to assess if the logic would give reasonable recommendations. The algorithm was typically scored to be conservative with frequent recommendations to a balanced portfolio. The answers to the risk tolerance and investment time frame questions typically had the highest algorithm scores. Most firms classified an investor into one of five investor profiles, such as growth or balanced. Now, some had more investor profiles, such as 10, with more granular distinctions between the different types of investors. And there was at least one model portfolio of securities linked to each investor profile, but some had more than one. For example, a firm may have different model portfolios for the same investor profile to accommodate different levels of invested assets with more ETFs used for higher dollar accounts. All investments in the model portfolios were simple ETFs or investment funds, and they were mostly third-party products. Typically, there were about eight to 10 different ETFs in each portfolio. And typically, the same ETFs would be used across many different portfolios with the asset allocations changed based on the investor profile. Investment management fees varied across the firms, but in general, they were about 50 to 70 basis points on assets under management per year, plus the ETF MERs of five to 30 basis points as an example. In most cases, trading commissions and custodial fees were included in the management fee. So all in, it was about 55 to 100 basis points per year for an investor. And the client's custodian for most firms was an IROC dealer member. What most firms did well? System development. In most cases, external system developers were used. 
In other cases, this was done internally with in-house programmers and developers. Cybersecurity management. Since private information is exchanged online, firms were on top of cybersecurity, in many cases hiring third-party experts to audit and test their system. Disclosure of fees, the services they offer, and the use of an investor profile and an investment policy statement for the, compliant, for the client. Online access for clients to regularly view their holdings, investment performance returns, and how much they've paid in fees. Marketing. Although some firms use TV ads and traditional print ads, most firms use lower cost ways to attract clients, such as use of Twitter, blogs, and online ads. And they offer promotions, such as the first $5,000 invested is free. And they developed marketing partnerships with other companies millennials use. And they've developed referral arrangements with traditional PMs to refer clients that don't meet their account minimums. Adapting to investor needs. Some firms engage well with clients through test groups and seminars to get their feedback to try to improve their experience and service. As one example, based on investor feedback, a firm began offering the option of socially responsible ETFs in model portfolios. And many firms created an advisory board with experts in their fields to help grow and develop the business. Experts tended to be from four fields, marketing, investments, technology, and academia. And we had no significant suitability of investment concerns based on our sample testing. I'll now highlight five online advisor specific deficiencies we raised at some of the firms we reviewed. The first being an inadequate KYC questionnaire. Such as there was no questions or inadequate questions on financial circumstances, investment knowledge, or investment restrictions. An example of an inadequate question on financial circumstances is when the question just asks about the client's liquid assets and not also about their other assets. Insufficient or unclear questions on risk tolerance. For example, only one question was asked. Or a question was not clear, such as asking the client if they can accept big losses without quantifying what big means. Or the question was too complex such as asking the investor what they would do with their domestic stock portfolio if they learned that the foreign stock markets were in crisis. No question on debt. This is important, as in some cases, investors should pay off their debt before investing, such as if they have a negative net worth or high credit uh, card debt. Answers to KYC questions on financial circumstances, such as income and net worth, were not scored to factor into the system's recommendation of a model portfolio. Now the CSA notice provides guidance about a well-designed online KYC questionnaire and process. It suggests using a series of behavioral questions to establish risk tolerance and other KYC information. As such, you, sh you should avoid questions which simply ask, what is your risk tolerance amongst low, medium, or high options? Instead, develop a clear example of a set of circumstances, such as one showing their future portfolio value going up and down over time, and asking which portfolio they are most comfortable with. Require all questions to be answered before a recommendation is given. If the client doesn't answer all questions, either there must, there must be an AR call with the client or the account shouldn't be opened. Test for inconsistencies in answers and not let the client complete the questionnaire until they're resolved. For example, a pop-up box could state, you answered question X indicating you have a low risk tolerance and answered question Y indicating you have a high risk tolerance 
which is an inconsistency which would need to be addressed. And you may allow the client to address the inconsistencies by changing her answer or by calling an advising rep. Flag inconsistencies in, ans in answers that would trigger an advising rep call. For example, one answer indicates the client has an investment time frame of less than three years and another answer indicates they desire the highest possible returns. Offer investor education about the terms and concepts involved. For example, explaining what an ETF is. And remind investors that an advising rep is available to help them throughout the process. And overall, we understand the need for efficiency in the online client onboarding process. But this must be balanced with the effectiveness of the KYC and suitability process. Here's some best practices for KYC questions. Ask enough questions, such as 10 to 15, so that there is an adequate KYC process. Four to five questions generally will not achieve this. To put things into perspective, a well-known risk tolerance questionnaire used globally by traditional PMs has 25 questions on risk attitudes and values alone. So my point is that 10 to 15 questions is not too many. Questions should be clearly and simply worded. Avoid acronyms and jargon. Again, some clients may not know what an ETF is. Use multiple choice format to allow for consistency and efficiency. Include questions on investment needs and objectives, risk tolerance, annual income, net worth, investment time horizon, investment knowledge, and age. For net worth, ask separately for a breakdown of financial and non-financial assets and debt. For example, the amount of debt may be used to assess if the debt should be paid off before investing. Ask several questions on risk tolerance so that you can cover both their risk willingness and risk capacity. And because it can be a hard thing to accurately capture with just one question. Ask the investor if they have any investment restrictions and give examples such as they don't want to invest in tobacco companies. Or alternatively, add a notice on the website requesting the client to contact an advising rep if they have any investment restrictions. At a minimum, answers to legally required questions on their investment needs and objectives, risk tolerance, and financial circumstances must be scored to factor into a recommendation. Test the questions for understandability and their outcome with a test group, such as family, friends, and colleagues, but not just people at your firm or in the investment industry. Implement systematic process to identify and address inconsistencies in answers, such as a high return expectation, but a low risk tolerance. Use charts, graphs, examples, and definitions that accompany the questions. For example, many people are visually inclined and respond better to pictures and words together rather than just words alone. Use dollar amounts instead of percentages in questions. Behavioral economics suggests investors relate better to dollars than percentages. For example, a potential loss of $10,000 may give a better indicator of someone's risk tolerance than a loss of 20%. Allow investors enough time to complete and review their answers to the questions, such as allowing them to save their answers before submitting them so they can revisit them later and either confirm or change them. There should be no rush for investors to complete the KYC questions given their importance. Second key review finding. In some cases, we found no evidence of advising rep review and approval of the client's KYC information collected online and the system recommended model portfolio. 
a human registered advising rep must review and approve the client's KYC information and perform a suitability assessment. This applies even for a call as needed online advisor where the system doesn't flag a call as required or doesn't flag inconsistencies in answers for review. Remember that the online system itself is not registered, so these activities must be performed by a registered advising representative. Best practices. The advising rep signs and dates that she has reviewed and approved the KYC information and the system recommended model portfolio. The, and the signature or initial may be electronic or wet. Use an online portal for the PM's internal use only for the advising rep's review and approval processing and tracking. Where appropriate, such as, in a case, such as in cases where the client has unique needs or inconsistencies in their KYC answers, document any analysis, comments, or follow-up done by the AR to support her suitability assessment, whether an AR to client call happens or not. In more simple cases, for firms with a not always call model, where the system hasn't raised any issues, the review and approval process by an AR could be done for many clients in batches or at the end of the day. Third key finding, no meaningful discussion with clients. We expect all PMs to have a meaningful discussion with their clients. Whether it is a traditional PM in the context of a face-to-face -face meeting with a client or an online advisor through its interactive website supplemented as required with a live interaction between an advising rep and the client. In some cases, we found from our sweep review of online advisors that the AR did not always have a discussion with every client. And this was for a PM approved as an always call advisor. Another finding, the AR did not timely have a discussion with a client that was identified as requiring a call. This is for PM approved as a call as needed advisor. For example, the account was funded but not invested more than one month after the KYC question were, questions were completed because the AR client call hadn't yet taken place. Another finding, the AR had a discussion with the client, but it was not a meaningful discussion. For example, there was no discussion of the client's circumstances. And lastly, the AR had a discussion with the client, but did not adequately document what was discussed and the outcome of the discussion. So in this case, there was no evidence of a meaningful discussion. Some best practices. Timely arrange, within a few days if possible, for an AR client discussion soon after the client completes the KYC questionnaire. Let the client choose their preferred method for a discussion, whether it be by phone call, video call, text, email, online chat, or some other means. Discuss the client's KYC answers, circumstances, and explain the recommended portfolio, and allow time for the client to ask questions. Use a standard checklist of questions to ask and topics to cover and a standard form to document answers and take notes, whether it's electronic or on paper. Document the name of the client and the advising rep, what was discussed and when, and the outcome of the discussion, such as a change in the recommended model portfolio. And especially, document KYC information if it's different from answers to KYC questionnaire, or if supplemental to what is on the KYC questionnaire. A fourth uh, key finding, an inadequate KYC update process. In some cases, there was no process to update the client's KYC information at least annually or more frequently when there was a material change in the client's circumstances. Some best practices. Have the existing clients recomplete the online KYC questionnaire each year 
for example, on each one-year anniversary of the opening of their account, or when there is a material change in their circumstances, such as the loss of a job, marriage, or divorce, and send them reminders if they don't complete the questionnaire. Or alternatively, send specific notice, such as an email to each client upon the one-year anniversary of the opening of their account to let them know to inform you if there are any material changes in their circumstances. And if there are, have them recomplete the online KYC questionnaire or set up a call with an advising rep. Now in cases where a client indicates there are no material changes in their circumstances, have them confirm this, such as by asking them to click an online button on their portal so that you receive a positive response and can keep records of your KYC update process. Further, add a general notice on your website or a client's online portal for the client to inform you if there are any material changes in their circumstances. And maintain evidence of your attempts to update clients' KYC information. For example, log of uh, client names and dates KYC questionnaires or update requests were sent, and the status or outcome of the updating process, such as no response was received or the client recompleted the KYC questionnaire. And the fifth key finding, no notice to the OSC of material changes to the business model. Some firms did not submit a change of registration information form, which is known as an F5, to OSC staff when there, were, when there was a material change to the, to the firm's primary business activities, target market, or the products or services they provide to clients, as compared to information that was uh, uh, previously submitted in the firm's registration application form. The PM's registration application form must be kept current at all times with the OSC or were your principal regulator. And th this was highlighted in the CSA staff notice uh, 31342 on, on online advice. Here are some examples of material changes to business models in the context of online advisors where notice should be filed. A traditional PM that also wants to be an online advisor. A PM that is approved for online advising that wants to add a traditional PM business model. A PM that is, a, that is approved as an always call online advisor that wants to become a call as needed online advisor. A material new business arrangement to obtain new clients. An example is a new online portal for referral agents to use to refer clients to the online advisor. More risky or complex securities or strategies proposed in model portfolios, such as use of individual equities, bonds, or alternative funds in portfolios, or use of a short selling or leverage strategy. There's a material change to the KYC and suitability process, such as the KYC questions or the algorithms have been materially changed. And any proposed changes that are materially different from the business activities and models described in the CSA staff notice on online advising. Now for some last words. We identified other findings from the sweep as well, uh, and these included an inadequate ratio of advising reps to clients and unsubstantiated claims in marketing materials. These are consistent with findings from you, reviews of all PM firms, and I'll refer you to past year's annual reports uh, to registrants for, for guidance on these deficiencies. The outcomes of the sweep reviews were that in all cases a compliance a uh, review report was issued requiring the firm to address all the identified deficiencies. In a small number of cases, we also, also issued a warning letter or terms and conditions on registration were imposed. 
And we continue to have a, a regulators committee on online advice issues, which has members from the CSA, IROC, and the MFDA. The committee discusses issues from compliance reviews and business proposals for online advisors, including appropriate registration categories and terms and conditions. That being said, proposals that are more novel or complex than the business models we discussed today would likely go through the OSC Launchpad team and the other CSA jurisdictions' regulatory sandbox teams. The online advisor space continues to evolve, such as with unique business partnerships and new products and services. For example, we are starting to get requests for more complex portfolio holdings. Now this was an expected evolution and is happening incrementally. We have and will continue to assess with our CSA colleagues if this is appropriate in the online space, especially firms with a not always call model. We have also started to see firms offering additional and more personalized services, such as tailored portfolios and financial planning, sometimes at a higher cost or to clients with a higher account size. These additional and more personal services are consistent with what traditional PMs offer to their high net worth clients. And we've also seen traditional PMs increasing their use of technology so some online advisors are becoming more like traditional PMs and vice versa. In closing, online advice continues to be an area of focus for us. In terms of next steps, we will continue to review online advisors as part of pre-registration reviews, F5 filings, and during field examinations once they are operational for a period of time. Now, over to Scott for guidance on small firms. Thank you, Trevor. From October 2014 to June 2016, we and our CSA colleagues conducted compliance reviews of numerous small firms. The firms were from the PM, EMD, and IFM registration categories. We issued a staff notice, CSA Staff Notice 31350, in May providing the results of our reviews and guidance. So what is a small firm? Firms were selected for review if they had only one registered individual, in the case of a portfolio manager, one advising representative. While the guidance is directed towards small firms, a lot of the material may be applicable to registrants of all sizes. I'll provide an overview of the results of the CSA's review and a summary of the guidance provided, with an emphasis on the issues relevant to portfolio managers. While reference is made throughout to advising representative, the guidance is equally applicable to dealers with only one dealing representative. We identified nine common deficiencies that the firms reviewed. The percentages on the slide indicate how often each deficiency was raised. While most of these deficiencies are not unique to small firms, the first, business interruptions and succession planning, becomes even more important when there is only one advising representative to service the portfolio manager's clients. As a result, I will focus on this issue. Segregation of duties is also difficult to achieve in small firms, so I will provide an overview of the guidance provided to small firms to mitigate this inherent issue. Finally, I will cover some of the other common deficiencies identified. If the sole advising representative at a portfolio manager is no longer capable of performing his or her registrable duties due to illness or death, for example, client portfolios can no longer be managed by the firm unless it is able to register another advising representative. Alternatively, the client will have to engage another PM firm to manage his or her portfolio. The loss of the firm's sole advising rep could have significant impact on clients, especially those who may require liquidity from their portfolios. The risk to clients is higher during volatile markets where active management of the portfolios may be required. In order to manage these risks, it is crucial for small firms to have a succession plan, either separately or as part of their business continuity plan or BCP for short. We have seen several different methods for succession planning. Small firms should consider designating an individual 
also known as the BCP executor, to manage the wind down or sale of the business in the event of the loss of the sole advising representative. The BCP executor could be internal, for example, a director of the firm or support or other administrative staff, or external, for example, the firm's lawyer or accountant, or the registered individual's spouse. Note that these individuals are not permitted to perform registrable activity while acting as the BCP executor unless they are appropriately registered. Some portfolio managers have drafted letters to send to their clients should they die or become incapacitated. The letter will generally inform the client that the advising representative is no longer able to service the account and the client should make arrangements to find another portfolio manager. Some registrants provide examples of other portfolio managers with similar investment styles in this letter. Alternatively, the firm can negotiate with other portfolio managers with similar investment styles to take over management of the firm's accounts in the event of the death or incapacitation of the firm's sole advising rep. As advising representatives cannot act for two firms, this may require exempted relief. More on that in a little while. When developing a BCP, consider including, for example, 1. Procedures to mitigate, respond to, and recover from business interruptions and other types of disturbances that may disrupt the firm's day-to-day -day operations, such as fires and floods. 2. How the firm will communicate with clients, key personnel, and third-party service providers, and of course us, the regulators. 3. Procedures to protect, backup, and recover the firm's books and records. For example, as a result of a cybersecurity incident or a natural disaster. And four, detail alternative office space and the relocation of the firm's operations. See Staff Notice 31350 for more details. The firm's BCP should be appropriate for the size and business model of the firm. Succession planning should be addressed in the firm's BCP or a separate document and include items such as 1. Assignment of duties to wind down or continue the firm, including who is responsible for notifying the regulators in the event of the death, incapacitation or prolonged absence of the advising representative. 2. The information to communicate it to clients, for example, by providing clients with the name and contact details of the BCP executor and explaining to clients how they can access their assets in the end event of the loss of the firm's key personnel or by providing the client with the name and contact details of the relationship manager at the custodian where the client's assets are held. Other matters that should be addressed by the PM's BCP are staff training, how often the BCP is updated and tested, and assessing the BCP of the firm's service providers. When a firm has no administrative staff, the PM may need an external BCP executor. Careful consideration should be given when appointing a BCP executor that they are capable of executing the required steps. When working with an external BCP executor, it is prudent to ensure 1. A written agreement is in place so that the BCP executor understands his or her responsibilities. 2. The BCP executor is familiar with the, B the firm's BCP. Three. The BCP executor is familiar with the firm's business to properly wind down or temporarily manage the small firm or facilitate the transfer of the firm's clients' accounts. 4. A confidentiality agreement is in place if the BCP executor would have access to client, confidential client information and that the firm has properly prearranged client authorization to share this confidential information by, for example, uh, disclosing this in the relationship disclosure information. 5. If the BCP executor is another registrant, conflicts of interest between both firms have been considered, such as the external BCP executor could be managing clients of two firms in a scenario of temporary absence. And 6. The BCP executor understands security legislation and is aware of costs, for example, the costs related to filing an application for exemptive relief. There are circumstances where exemptive relief may be granted to assist in implementing a BCP. For example, while there is a restriction on acting for another registered firm set out in Section 4.1 of National Instrument 31103, we are prepared to consider on a case-by-case -case basis applications for exemptive relief from this section on an expedited basis. 
In light of the potentially immediate adverse impact to clients, a significant business interruption such as the death, incapacitation, or prolonged absence of the sole registered individual would likely be a valid business reason for a BCP executor to be registered with more than one registered firm. Small firms may have resource constraints that make segregation of duties difficult or impossible. These challenges make ensuring good documentation practices and controls especially important for small firms in order to demonstrate good compliance. One method of overcoming this challenge is through the use of non-registered staff who can, for example, proofread documents, double-check calculations and verify that the registered representative has completed the KYC and other client forms. The use of technology can also be helpful, for example, using portfolio management software to implement automated compliance checks pre-trade and post-trade. We found that small firms often did not maintain adequate books and records to evidence compliance with securities legislation and the firm's own policies and procedures. Often, small firms have inadequate policies and procedures. Firms that are registered in more than one category may not have policies and procedures to cover, for example, their responsibilities as an investment fund manager. If any functions are outsourced, for example, fund accounting, transfer agent and trust accounting, functions of an IFM, or portfolio management to a sub-advisor, a firm should develop written policies and procedures and document how it adequately oversees these outsourced functions. A PM can use books and records of other parties, for example, the client's custodians, to reconcile to its own books and records. However, a PM must maintain its own books and records, including client trades and holdings. Evidence of the reconciliation process should also be maintained. Policies and procedures surrounding conflicts of interest were often inadequate, in particular those surrounding personal trading by access persons at the firm. CCO report to the Board of Directors. The PM CCO must provide a report to the Registrar's Board at least annually. For a lot of small firms, the CCO is the only member of the Board of Directors. However, we still expect there to be a formal report to the Board on an annual basis. We see a lot of small firms where either there is no report at all or it is extremely limited. We expect the CCO report to the Board to describe the steps that were taken to perform the assessment, the results of the assessment including any significant instances of non-compliance, for example, any personal trading violations, and what has been done or will be done to address the non-compliance. The CCO of a small firm can meet the annual report requirements by documenting this assessment in the firm's Board of Directors minutes or can produce a separate document. Financial reporting. A number of the small firms had deficiencies with their accounting practices or excess working capital calculations. Firms would often outsource financial reporting to third-party bookkeepers. If doing so, a firm should establish procedures that indicate who prepares the financial records, how they are calculated, who reviews and approves calculations and results, and when each of these activities occurs. Firms with only one individual should at the minimum develop procedures to state when and what financial records will be prepared. We also found that some firms applied the cash basis accounting method instead of the accrual basis accounting method. For instance, firms were not accruing revenues as they were earned. Instead, they were waiting for when cash was received to recognize revenues. Similarly, expenses were not being accrued as they were incurred. Instead, they were expensed when paid. For example, if you are aware of an, an expense incurred for legal costs but have not received the invoice, the expected amount of the legal expense should be accrued during the month it was incurred and not when the invoice was paid. Some small firms maintain a nominal amount of excess working capital. Unforeseen expenses incurred can cause a working capital deficiency. In this scenario, a firm might need to calculate its excess working capital position on a more frequent basis than monthly, such as daily or weekly. Other issues we noted included a failure to calculate the excess working capital correctly, for example, by failing to use financial statements using accrual accounting as just discussed, or by failing to make the appropriate deduction for market risk for investments held by the firm. We will continue to review small firms as part of our ongoing, ongoing compliance reviews. During the compliance review, we will usually review the areas I've just discussed today. That concludes our presentations for today. 
On this slide, we have included some resources for all the topics we've discussed during our presentations.